Minister heads to court to stop the special prosecutor from further investigating her. But the OSB has preferred new charges against her as well. The same day today, we have copies of all the documents, including expert analysis on this matter. Stay with us here on Ghana tonight. We've also been monitoring closely and nosing around for insider information as a parliamentary committee probing the alleged plot to oust the IGP resume sitting in camera. We have some updates for you on this matter here on Ghana tonight. Stay with us. Also, the Attorney General offers legal advice on Professor Kornafi Bobwatin's Galamse report, describing the report in terms that came to many as a surprise. We should get into the details of the advice and speak to some experts on this matter. Very worrying indeed, to say the, the least, and that's what the environmentalists have described the, the AGES report. But stay with us, we're getting to all of that here on Ghana tonight. As always, you are an integral part of the conversation. Let's hear from you. The hashtag we're using is Ghana Tonight on Facebook and Twitter. Let's get talking. Let's settle for Ghana Briefs. The Office of the Special Prosecutor has charged former Sanitation Minister Cecilia Dapa with the offense of failing to comply with a lawful demand. Documents filed in court alleges that Cecilia Dapa failed to fill and submit an income declaration form handed her by investigators. The OSP has in the last two months been investigating the former minister for possible ownership of tainted property which investigators say cannot be attributed to her known income. $590,000 and 2.8 million cities found in her residence have since been seized. The Attorney General says former Environment Minister Professor Kwabnafrim Pomboating failed to cooperate with investigators who attempted to probe his controversial report. Godfrey Dami therefore concludes there is no evidence to form the basis for the prosecution of any of the named government officials and other persons for stifling the fight against corruption. <music> the Inspector General of Police's legal team expressed concerns about the conduct of Chairman Samuel Atachia accusing him of being biased and directing the committee into areas beyond its scope. Omar came here because this is about them also. And so they entered the room. Indeed, it is our argument that Pomap should have remained in the room. And if, even if the IGP had to leave, he could have left certain members of Pomap there to answer certain questions. But when we went in, um, the chairman said, well, it is supposed to be in camera, and therefore uh, not everybody ought to be there. Again, out of abundance of respect for the Speaker of Parliament, for Parliament, and the committee and the chairman, Puma members agreed and excused themselves, leaving the IGP and his lawyers. It is my view that it was a compromise. Aggrieved customers of the defunct Gold Coast Fund Management Company are dissatisfied with the finance minister's failure to address them during their picketing at the ministry. The group is requesting the disbursement of approximately 5.5 billion cities owed them following approval from Parliament. 5.5 billion was approved in 2021 main budget. When that approval was done, there has not been disbursement. But all documents available from the finance ministry and the government in the Parliament House and the public domain indicates that the government has spent 26 billion in paying out customers who fell victims to the financial cleanup. The majority leader in parliament, Oseiche Mensa Bonsu, wants the new patriotic party to continue engaging Alan Tremating, citing his strong loyalty to the party's ideology as a potential return to the party. The Swami member of parliament tells TV3 he was surprised when Alan Tremating pulled out of the NPP flag bearer race and subsequently resigned from the party. My Bible teaches me 
uh, Christ Jesus it was who said to us that if you have sheep numbering uh, a hundred and uh, one goes uh, missing or goes astray, you leave the 99 to fetch the, the one that has gone astray. So I think that every effort still must be made uh, if, even if there is a one percentage possibility. Let's see what will come out of it. A storm of cases and controversy has erupted following the Ghana Boxing Authority's decision to overturn the verdict of Emmanuel Quarter's victory in a recent league bout. Well, make some time and visit 3news.com and you can find some more news there. Coming up next here on Ghana tonight, the legal battle between the former sanitation minister and the OSP. That's a special prosecutor takes a new dimension as the under fire former sanitation minister heads to court to stop the special prosecutor from further investigating her. But the OSP has also preferred new charges against her today. Now, we have copies of all the, the court documents, including the, some expert analysis and, and not personal opinions. We're going to look specifically into what the law really says about how things are playing out. This, uh, the never-ending saga between the OSP and, and also Cecilia Bradapa. Now, the former sanitation minister has filed an injunction application against the, the special prosecutor to stop any further investigation and prosecution until the freeze of her account and the cash that was seized from her Abilene Bay resident is, is determined. Now, let me show you excerpts of the injunction application. Here's what we, we gleaned. Now, per the court documents filed today, uh, October 10, uh, the lawyers of Cecilia Dapa say if the OSP is not restrained, the accused will suffer irreparable damage. You see there, I filed an application for an order of judicial review in this honorable court for the following reliefs. A, a declaration that the respondent's re-seizure of the money, that's the OSP's re of the money initially seized from the applicant's home on the 24th um, of July and refreezing of applicant's bank accounts respectively on 5th September 2023 is unfair, unreasonable. Cecilia Dapa says that that act by the OSP is unfair, it's unreasonable, it's capricious, it's arbitrary, and ultra-various the respondent's statutory powers under Act 959 relative to the constitutional provisions of Article 23 and 296 of the 1992 Constitution of the Republic of Ghana. Now, take a look at this. Continues, B, that Cecilia Dapa wants an order for the OSP to release the money Received on the 5th of September to the applicant and to unfreeze her bank account, an order prohibiting the respondent from continuing the investigation of the applicant and her husband for corruption and corruption related. So, what Silapa is saying is that the court should prohibit the OSP from, from even continuing with the investigation into the corruption and corruption related offenses. Stop it. That's what it wants the court to do. And D, any such further or other orders as this honorable court may deem fit. That's not all. Sister Adapa, in this injunction application, is asking for judicial review. It says, my application for judicial review was necessitated by the respondent's prejudicial and arbitrary conduct from the inception of his investigations into corruption and corruption-related offenses allegedly involving me and my husband. Seven, I am advised by my counsel and verily believe same to be true that to prevent further violation of my constitutionally guaranteed rights and rendering my application for judicial review or tales, it is imperative that the respondent is restrained from continuing his investigation pending the determination of my said application. So that's what Cecilia Dapa is asking for, amongst other things. And in fact, that's a number of things that he is, is, is talking about. And in the thrust of the matter here now is 
raising fundamental questions uh, uh, of the OSP charges against her, essentially asking that the investigation should be ceased. Meanwhile, today, we also got to know that the Office of Special Prosecutor has also charged San Cecilia Dapa with the offense of failing to comply with a lawful demand. I'm going to put that on the screen shortly. Documents filed in court alleges that Cecilia Dapa failed to fill and submit an income declaration form handed her by investigators. This is it. We have, that's the, 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 the charge sheet you see there. Essentially, the statement of offense details count one, failing to comply with the lawful demand of an unauthorized, an authorized officer of the Office of the Special Prosecutor in the performance of his functions, contrary to section 69-1A of the Office of the Special Prosecutor Act 2017. Act 959. He continues. This is just count one, right? Now, let's take a look at what's happened specifically. The OSP has, in, in the last two months, if you recall, been investigating the former minister for possible ownership of, of certain assets and businesses that have been re registered in other persons' names. In, in fact, Section 691A. Of the, of the Office of Special Prosecutor Act 2017, Act 959. Uh, follow me closely. It says, a person who fails to comply with the lawful demand of an authorized officer in the performance of the functions under this act commits an offense and is liable on summary conviction to a fine of not less than 500 penalty units and not more than 1,000 penalty units or to a term of imprisonment of not less than two years and not more than four years or to both. So what the OSP is saying is that with the violation of this particular requirement by Cecilia Adapa, this is the term of imprisonment that she, if found guilty, she could be liable for two years and the 500 penalty units. Now, so this has been the back and forth. Just today, we've seen the fresh move by Cecilia Adapa to for the application of injunction to stop off all some investigation by the OSP. And the OSP now also going in to, to make the point that Cecilia Dapa failed to fill and resubmit the income declarations form that was given to her. Martin Pebble is private legal practitioner. He been, she's been following this uh, quite closely, how this case has been playing out. And he's, he's joined us on, on Zoom. Thank you so much, uh, Martin people for time here on Ghana Tonight. So yesterday, you cast doubt on Cecilia Dapa's alibi of um, the, the money in her deceased brother's account and how she accessed it to pay her deceased brother's children's fees. What we are learning today as we put on the screen, is that she has filed an injunction application against the OSP from prosecuting her until the freezing of her accounts and cash Caesar case is determined. And that a lawyer said th th that's going to be unfair if, if it's not granted. What's your take on this? Uh, <laughs> and not, and naturally from... My previous comments and uh, all those things, you see that I don't agree. Because, um, you see, the case is that the first time, or let's say the last time they were in court, the one that uh, the judge threw out the application for confirmation of the uh, seizure of the currencies and the bank account, confirmation of the freezing orders. The judge didn't deal with the case uh, to a finality. It was an application. What I'm trying to say before I explain further and further is that the OSP is allowed to do what it is currently doing. That's the re-seizure and the re-freezing uh, of the accounts. And so also the subsequent application to ask the judge to uh, confirm the seizure of the currency and then to freeze the account. It's allowed in law. It's even in the constitution that when a power is given in the constitution or any other law, that power can be used 
as many times as the circumstances that warrant the power to be used arise. So this thing about the re of the uh, uh, the re seizure of the currency and then the freezing of the account it's not new. No, if you were to open the phone lines or even on your website, you'll find thousands of citizens who can attest a situation where they have a criminal case, they go to court, the police for some reason don't do their work well, then the judge orders, discharged, I'm discharging you. So when they discharge the person, if the police are ready, just when the accused person steps out of the court, he's rearrested just outside the court. Of course, the, uh, the courts have warned the police against it, so it's not something that is uh, entertained, but it's still done. So even if they don't arrest the accused, rearrest the accused at the entrance to the court, mm -hmm. they allow him to go home or just move outside the court premises. He's rearrested. So I'm saying that this practice of rearresting, re-seizing currency and all that, it has been with us for decades. Hey, if it, that power didn't exist, then law enforcement would not be able to work with. If that power to rearrest, to re-seize currency, to re-freeze didn't exist, then law enforcement would not be able to work. So it means that the least mistake, then it means that an accused person or a suspect should walk free. No, 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 no. The criminal justice system doesn't uh, uh, encourage and promote uh, this and idle technicalities. No, we look at substantial justice. So we don't rely on small, small technical matters and just free somebody. So in this case, what we have is that Madame Dapa cannot explain how she got $1 million in her house. Two, she cannot explain how she got five. Uh, hello? Uh, lawyer? Uh, um, Three, she yeah, cannot explain right. how she got 2.86 million Ghana cities. Mm -hmm. The Kente and all those other things. And once she cannot explain, why would we say she should walk scot free? If we did that, then we'll be encouraging many other people to also uh, follow in her footsteps. Mm. No. So this then I don't support it. I think what we are looking for is substantial justice. And that is what is done in the court. So I'm sure the OSP will make such arguments and then the court will decide. But don't forget the public opinion is very important in this matters. For us, once we've seen that plenty money and so far, Madam Dapa cannot explain. And you know very well that she has even been charged under Section 69 yes. for failing to provide an explanation, right, mm -hmm. of how she came by the money. How can such a person be allowed to go away with the, but, the, 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 this money? You see, lawyer, uh, per the court documents filed today, which uh, we put portions of it on the screen for our viewers to follow closely, the, her lawyers say if the OSP is not restrained, the, the accused, that's Cecilia Dapa, will suffer irreparable damage. And that but they want the courts to balance her rights against the state's power to fight corruption. How about that? When I was talking implicitly, I was balancing the, the rights. Yeah, so the state, the accused or suspect has a right to be presumed innocent until proven guilty, as under Article 19 of our Constitution, has a right to get fair trial and by extension, fair investigations, all those. Yes, I've looked at them. As I mentioned, the key thing is that the first time that they went before the court and the court threw out those applications, under our law, we are allowed to repeat, that's to come back again when you gather your evidence in a better fashion. So lawyers know the case of, um, they'll tell you, Vanderpoel versus Nati. That's one case. It's 1970-something. You get it there. And then in the uh, 2000, after uh, 2007, 2008, the case of Republic versus High Court, Commercial Division, ex party Andreas Hesse. Lawyer Hesse's case. Lawyer Hesse of blessed memory. Where the yeah, Supreme yeah, Court... Uh, made a point that you can repeat an application. You can go back to the court a second time, third time, fourth time. If the first one you were caught by some uh, this uh, unfortunate incident, like maybe you didn't bring all the evidence, and so 
or there's been new development, it's allowed. When it's in a trial court, the threshold that you have to clear is very low. It, it, you don't likely get such a situation where the OSP is doing when you are on appeal. It is when a case is on appeal that it is very hard to go back and bring fresh evidence. That one on appeal, they will tell you Poku versus Poku and a thousand and one other cases. When the case is on appeal and you want to bring fresh evidence to convince the court, oh, it's almost impossible. Very few exceptions, except something like you see the OG Dom versus Ghana, uh, this and tele, uh, 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 Vodafone, mm -hmm. Ghana, uh, yeah, Vodafone, yeah, in recent times, then the Supreme Court granted it because the state was going to lose a lot of money mm -hmm. if they didn't allow uh, this and Ghana Telecom to bring new evidence, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that apart, on appeal, it's difficult, difficult to bring fresh evidence. But when you are in a trial court, like we are in the high court, when we say trial court, that's the first time that the case goes to court. So this same high court dealing with this matter, in certain situations, it is an appellate court. It is not a trial court. So when a matter starts in the district court, in a civil case, and it goes to the high court, the high court is an appellate court. Or if it's a criminal matter, it starts in the circuit court, and it goes on appeal to the high court, the high court is an appellate court. But this is the other matter. It started in the high court. So the high court is the trial court. So here you can repeat applications far more easily than when you go on appeal. I see. Well, uh, Matik Pebu, uh, thank you very much uh, for this. And uh, also, uh, we're, we're going to monitor quite closely how uh, the day will play out and in the coming days, um, how this particular case will play out, especially because the application for the abridgment of time on this case by Cecilia Dapa is expected to be ahead tomorrow, all things being equal. So we'll see how things play out. But coming up next here on Ghana Tonight, Attorney General, uh, Minister of Justice, offers legal advice on Professor Konofi Pombuatin's Galamsey report, describing the report in terms that can really be described as, to many as a surprise. We will get into the details of that advice and... Um, and then also speak to some experts on, on this matter. And the, the Attorney General, Godfrey Yobo Adami, says that there is no evidence in the Professor from Pombuating Galamse report to form the basis for the prosecution of any of the named government officials. There are quite a number of government officials who are named in this Professor 36 page report. And uh, other persons who are alleged to be uh, stifling the fight against illegal mining. Let me give you excerpts of this report. And that's the AG's opinion on Professor Kwabnafi Paul Boatin's 36-page report. Take a look at this. This is the AG's opinion on this. First off, uh, he states that after a careful study of the report, the various documents and pen drives submitted to the police, we do not find any evidence in support of the allegations made against the persons cited in the report, with the exception of Seth Mante, John Ofori, Atta, and Eko Iwusi. One of them mentioned there's a journalist, right? These, these three exceptions. The Attorney General continues that it is recorded that several attempts by the police to obtain further information from Professor Von Boating to substantiate the allegations made in the report and to assist them to conduct further investigation Prove futile. That's what the AG says. That the attempt to obtain information from Professor Fumo Bhatti prove futile. Now, we'll recall an interview that I, I, I had with him and I asked him this specific question. So you stay with us. The, he says, the professor refused to provide any further information to the police. He also declined to give a written statement, claiming his report is an embodiment of his statement and all the information he has on the allegations. Investigations by the police have not revealed any evidence in support of the allegations. And it continues that the allegations are therefore bare and do not provide a basis for any criminal charge against the persons cited in the report, except the three names that I mentioned in the first slide. 
the Attorney General continues that in the absence of any evidence on the docket in support of any of the allegations of illegal mining activities, we are unable to recommend the prosecution of any of the persons cited in the, in the report. Now, here are some of the names of the persons who were cited in, in the report. Uh, we'll put it on the screen shortly. And uh, specific, uh, there's the likes of Lord Kome and others will pull that for you. But Professor Kobna from Pom Boating, when I sat with him a few months ago on this report, I asked him that specific question about the commitment to fight illegal mining and whether this report, if he believes, um, is going to be taken seriously. Remember, it has been on, on, the, on wherever, whichever office he submitted it to, to the office of the president for two years. And eventually, you recall that the presidency described the report as mere hearsay. And then the attorney general's opinion now says, you know what? There's not enough basis to prosecute any of the persons captured in there. But this is what Professor Kwambati said. Take a look. Orders on investigations. And let's respect uh, his orders and move on and see how we can bring this under control. But, but do you still stand by all the details in that report? Oh, yes. You stand by them? Yes. Regardless of the... the uh, defense by some of the people who have been captured in that report that what you are saying is not true no see uh, uh, it wasn't an easy thing writing about some of my colleagues it wasn't easy but I had to be brutally honest with the president mm. and that is why I did what I did so that I could have said oh Mr. President everything is okay You're under control maybe give me time we're able to do it you write some wishy washy thing and then not achieve anything, but I had to be honest with myself and knowing the president the way he is. He wanted the truth. True sure, indeed. Uh, and I did that from my point of view. The former member of parliament for Manson Quanta Constituency, for instance, whom you said that uh, owns multiple dozens of, of concessions uh, while he was a member of the Minerals Commission Board sold it out to some individuals for 200,000 CDs each. He says that he doesn't even own even one concession. He's ready to take you on in court. He's free to do that. I'm waiting for it. You're waiting for him to go to court? Yes. You, you have evidence to back the fact that he, he, he said, I'm waiting for him. concessions? I'm waiting for him. The presidency describes this report as a mere hearsay. Uh, I haven't heard that from him. In, in fact, it was in a, in, in a letter, communication to the public about your report? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think... Um, I don't know. I haven't read it. I haven't heard it. Well, that's Professor Frimpong Boateng there. And the, the opinion of the Attorney General on this report has generated some disquiet and concern amongst the especially the CSOs in the environmental space who are also asking questions about the commitment really to, to fight illegal mining in this country. But then Professor Fimpo Boating in this same report provided evidence of the level of degradation. In fact, the destruction caused our forest cover in this country as a result of illegal mining. Named some companies that had the tacit support and assistance of the, some of the people he mentioned in this report, including the likes of the late Kojo Shefriya Sejon, and then also a few other persons who were mentioned in there, and the company CG Alaska and so on. This, this, these are some of the, the forest reserves. The satellite images that Professor Paul Boatin provided evidence of in the report. About 10 of them, this is the second one. And then this one. You see the fourth as well. And this is the Etiwa Forest. This is the Etiwa Forest. You see there. All of this is captured in the Professor Kobna from Paul Boateng's report. The evidence of the destruction as a result of illegal mining in this country. Now, aside from this, there are 
four individuals who have also dragged their contamining to the CID of the Ghana Police Service, asking that they should be investigated. This is a contamining owned by uh, the Ashanti Regional Chair of the NPP, Chemawun Timi, and Chuboisiakun, Bernard and Chuboisiakun. Now, Adam Senano is one of the four. That's Adam Senano, uh, lawyer Martin Pebo, engineer Ken Ashibe, and uh, also the CDD fellow, Tukujwasari. Let's take a look at what they are asking the CID to look into with respect to the Akunta mining specifically. This is what they've gone to the CID to seek, that the activity of the mining company was in contravention of the Minerals and Mining Act 2006 at 703. Remember, the, the forest that Akunta Mining operates in is one of the pictures I just showed you of the level of destruction that Professor Fumobati captured in the report. He said CID should investigate the people acting as directors of Akunta Mining and also let them face the law as they are breaching the law against illegal mining. Now, it is this CID investigation, including this Professor Fumobati report, that was forwarded to the AG for advice. Adam Senanu is the co-chair of the Citizens Movement Against Corruption, one of four individuals that went to the CID with, with this, this particular uh, case is joining us. Mr. Senanu, thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. What's the status of the case that you took to the CID about Akunta Mining? From the CID, um, if you recollect, First, we wrote a letter asking, uh, there were four of us, including Martin Pebu, asking the police to act on the reports. Um, after a couple of weeks of not hearing anything, we went to find out. And we were told that no formal complaint had been lodged. We had to fill their forms. So we went back on a Monday, filled those forms, um, engaged at the highest level of CID, uh, uh, but I've heard nothing. So. I just a week ago I was thinking I should call Martin. Let's go and find out what is going on. It's several months later, no action, no response. So absolutely no clue what has become of our formally filed complaint. I see. So when you filed the case, the and did they see how they get back to you specifically with, with any follow-up questions or clarifications? and maybe further and better particulars on what you were seeking them to do? No, on the day of, I mean, when we went and we were told that our letter was not sufficient, because we had written a formal letter saying that the evidence was out there, and re referencing the minister's comments, both the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources and then the, uh, I forgot in which institution it was, that had also said that they didn't have a permit to do what they had done. And to say that, well, if the minister has spoken in the institutions, I was saying that this should not have happened. What is the police doing about it? Because you don't want to leave a sense that impunity uh, is allowed. I mean, nobody really bothers whether you can see that a crime has been committed. Um, and they said we needed to file a formal complaint. So beyond the letter, I haven't waited, I think, must have been at least some six weeks, no response, when they're formally we told you have to fill the forms, went back and complained on behalf of the people of Ghana. Um, we haven't heard anything. I see. I'm sure you've, you've also read the AG's um, advice to the CID on this uh, Professor Kovran Perform Boateng 36 page report. And the fact that it says there is not enough evidence to even make a case or, or prosecute the persons who are in government who have been captured in this report. That must come to you as a concern, is it not? Oh, yes, it is. I mean, um, the thing is that it is, it is sufficient for a citizen to raise the issues. It is now for our investigative bodies to do the research. Um, there is a gap there. There's a lacuna when you think through it. Are they saying that they have followed up with all the other names and events and issues he highlighted in his 36 pages? Because it seems to me like they focus on Professor Fribon Boating alone to the exclusion of all the other clues. Uh, but that's not how it's supposed to be done. Um, so it's very concerning. There appears to be a serious gap. Um, it's, it's, it's important that citizens, responsible citizens, report things and concerns they have. And it's important that 
the public servants, those who are to serve the public by doing their research, do that and get back to us. It is not sufficient for anyone to say that they found no evidence. Are they saying that they did? They followed all the clues? That part of the story has not come out very clearly in this particular report. Ms. Hmm. Anno, I appreciate your time. Well, thank you very much for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. And uh, especially for you, CSOs, so for what we are gleaning is a number of you are also uh, putting a petition together to submit to Parliament on Professor Frimpon Boateng's report as well, beyond what the AG has said. We'll see what happens as well in, in this regard. Thank you very much. Adam Senanu is the co-chair of the Citizens Movement Against Corruption, one of four individuals who have petitioned the CID um, on a contaminating operations um, in the Forest Reserve in the Ashanti region, and then also an aspect of the Professor Frimpon Boateng report as well. Uh, coming up next, we have also been monitoring closely, uh, nosing around for insider information as the parliamentary committee probing the alleged plot to oust the IGP resume sitting in camera. We have some updates for you on this matter. Very, very interesting development with some security analysts who have also been raising fundamental questions about the conduct of the members of this ad hoc committee. Stay with us. We'll be back shortly after this quick break. This is Ghana Tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to demonstrate to you the superior properties of Flamingo paint as compared to other paint brands on the market. We take equal quantities of flamingo paint and this ordinary paint. We then dilute them with water. And now, let the test begin. The gentleman on the left is going to apply the ordinary paint and the gentleman on my right will use the flamingo superior paint. As you can clearly see, flamingo has the obvious better hiding. Furthermore, flamingo has painted a much larger area you know one bucket of flamingo paint is equal to several buckets of any other paint brand on the market flamingo paint is made with superior formulation to give superior durability superior hiding superior coverage flamingo paint simply superior which is the original sizes ranging from the 1.5 horsepower, 2.0 horsepower, and the 2.5 horsepower. So if you are looking for an air condition to fit your homes, offices, schools, hotels, apartments, churches, it's Franco Trading Enterprise. For bulk purchases, look no further than Franco Trading Enterprise. Franco Trading Enterprise, the home of quality air conditioning. are a major stakeholder in nation building. Your voice matters. Start your day with us. We simplify the conversations, we break down the jargons and technicalities. We keep you well informed throughout the week. Start your day with us. We give the leaders the mandate to govern our affairs. We have a responsibility to hold them to account. It begins here. Start your day with us. Good morning, Ghana, Africa, and the rest of the wonderful world. Welcome to Sunrise on 3FM 92.7. Start your day well informed. Start with us on Sunrise on 3FM 92.7. Catch the Sunrise Morning Show with me, Johnny Hughes, Helen Apianpofo, and William Asidu. Weekdays from 5.55 a.m. to 10 a.m. only on 3FM 92.7. Your Urban Lifestyle Radio. This is Hot Issues, your passport to the most compelling conversations of our time. We go one-on-one -on -one with the movers and shakers, the thought leaders and the game changers.
We ask the questions that matter, and we don't back down. Tonight on Hot Issues, I sit with the man at the center of corruption investigations. Join me on Hot Issues here on TV3. Hot Issues, coming soon on TV3. TV3, first in news. Get ready to witness the most dramatic kitchen battle ever. Drama in the kitchen where rivalries simmer, ego sizzle, and only one rival can claim victory. Two rivals, spatulas in hand, egos on the line. It's not just about the food, it's about the drama. Can they put their differences aside to create the most loving meal? Or will the heat of the kitchen prove too much to handle? Are you a wife or a husband? Are you a girlfriend or a boyfriend? Can you cook with your partner's ex in a bid to see whose meal tastes better? Or can you compete with your mother-in-law or father-in-law in the kitchen? Then this is the show for you. On Drama in the Kitchen, you get into the kitchen with your partner's ex or in-law and prove that you own his or her taste buds. Hmm. So much drama and love in one kitchen be part of the drama in the kitchen experience by sharing your details via whatsapp on 027-722-2641 stay tuned for drama in the kitchen coming soon to tv3 To Ghana tonight. We're live on 23 Ghana on Facebook, Facebook channel 279, all across the world on 3 news.com. The Inspector General Police legal team expressed concern about the conduct of the chair of this seven member ad hoc committee investigating the leaked audio tape that captures an alleged plot to have the president sack him. That's Samuel Atachia, accusing him of being biased and directing the committee into areas beyond its scope. Now, this is Kofi, lawyer Kofi Bentel, is one of the lawyers of the IGP. This is where some of us have a problem with this whole thing. If you have to bring the head of internal security here to come and listen to his subordinates as to whether they have some evidence concerning his work. In the first place, if you are serving police officer, there is a process to use. It is not this place. Pomap came here because this is about them also. And so they entered the room. Indeed, it is our argument that Pomap should have remained in the room. And if, even if the IGP had to leave, he could have left certain members of Pomap there to answer certain questions. But when we went in, uh, the chairman said, well, it is supposed to be in camera. And therefore, uh, not everybody ought to be there. Again, out of abundance of respect for the Speaker of Parliament, for Parliament, and the committee and the chairman, Pomap members agreed and excused themselves, leaving the IGP and his lawyers. It is my view that it was a compromise. Well, so the chair of this committee, Samuel Atachia, also responded to these concerns raised by uh, the lawyers of uh, the IGP, Dr. George Kufodampari, of his conduct and the bias that he, they, they say they, they've seen about him. Take a look. It is very disappointing for anybody to say I'm biased. On the contrary, the generality of Ghanaians believe that have steered the affairs of the committee well. And if anybody is having jitters, I'm going to sort of uh, manufacture evidence against the IGP. Uh, it has no accord with common sense because what we are doing here, with the greatest of respect, is being recorded. So attaching her with, with whatever dexterity will not be able to improve upon the evidence. We have five fight, fight, finding committee, and it is being recorded and transcribed verbatim. So why am I being biased? So he says he disagrees with the, with, with the IGP's lawyers. But then, in addition to this, COP Alex Mensah retired, um, had also indicated that beyond what, the, what is going to be happening at the committee, in fact, he's reserved some things for, for in-camera hearings, which began today. So some of the things that he's refused to talk about in public he would make known to the committee in camera. Now, he questions the, the position by some people who do not believe that politics is involved in, in the promotion of police officers beyond a certain rank. 
been to the IGP. This is what he said when he sat with my colleague, Kemeni Amano. For that, I will not do. I will do that after the committee. Shall we come back to the committee? Um, where you had spoken about how unfairly you have been treated. Um, you thought that you had stayed in a position for too long without promotion. And that for you was unfair as a police officer. Why do you think you were not promoted? Why, why is that important to you? You see, that was an answer to a question that, that was asked by some of the committee members. And I said, and that was the truth. Why I was not promoted, I cannot say. Those who were responsible for the promotion, they were the ones who can say it. So I cannot. But they know it. Did politics play a role in this? Sure, I know that. You know that? Yes. Tell me more. No, I don't want to say it here. I will say it there. Mm. However, you said it there. That you thought that the closeness of the current IGP to the then NDC government is why he was promoted a lot of times above you. I didn't say that. You didn't? I didn't say that. What did you say? It was a question that they, they, they were trying to impugn that, but I didn't say that. What was your response then? Because I, I, I believe I remember you answered in the affirmative. That? That you thought that it was his closeness to... No, uh, I never the, said that. Right. I never. Do you believe that his closeness to the NDC was the reason he was promoted and that politics plays a role in the promotions of police officers? Uh, whoever says that politics does not play a role in the promotions of police officers, especially above certain ranks, does not know what he's saying. Go into the Constitution, you have the police council, we have the functions of the police council. And the constitution will tell you that promotions above the assistant commissioner of police, the council will recommend it to the president for president to promote. Who is the president? Is it a political figure? The police council. Is it a political figure? So whoever says that promotions above certain ranks doesn't have political things inside as you know what you say. Do you consider that uh, a danger to the police service? Very, very. Very, very dangerous. It's something that we need to look at and take it out of the constitution. Even the appointment of the IGP is something that we need to look at it. I, I, I'm going to ask you a bit more about politics and promotions in the service, but it, I cannot go without also asking you whether or not you thought politics played a role in you going above a certain level in the police service. Yes. Oh, that's your P. Alex Mensa retired there. Now, uh, Ken Officer Sabwaji retired. He's a respected security analyst globally joining us on Zoom for a quick conversation on this. Ken Officer Sabwaji, thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. So, two things. The concern by the IGP's lawyers that the, the committee is beginning to operate outside of, of its terms of reference. Plus what COP Alex Mensah is talking about, that really you, you, would, be, you would be very, very uh, infantile to say that you do not believe that there's some politics involved in promotions at the Ghana Police Service. This is dangerous, to say the least. Would you expect that a committee would make recommendations on this? For having me, I've been of the view that there is some empirical evidence that there is a bigger political agenda to remove the IGP from office. And that is more or less evidenced in the approach that the committee has adopted, which appears to widen the scope beyond its original terms of reference of, first of all, authenticating the leaked 
audio or video material and investigating the circumstances surrounding the plot to remove the IGP from office by some persons still in uniform in the police service and one or two others who are civilians. Coming back to your question, I don't hold the view that the committee has a mandate to investigate matters surrounding how the IGP is appointed. That must belong to another body or another mechanism, including, for instance, the Constitutional Review Commission, which I believe was conducted in about 2011, has stand to be corrected. And probably the current one being undertaken by the former Speaker of Parliament. But this committee, I think, should not have the remit of investigating any aspects of the IGP's appointment relating to the powers of the authority that appointed him. Having said that, I have listened to many well-read, well-informed um, legal and other scholars who think that this 1992 constitution has several orchestrations built into it in order to protect the power base of our former late president, J.J. Rollins. And even incumbents, not incumbents, political elite, including heads of states, have pronounced themselves along such lines, especially when they are in opposition. But when they are in power, and as our legal friends will say, they are clothed with the powers of taking steps to ensure that the constitution is amended in a way that addresses all the hiccups and some of the imbalances that we are seeing. Then they go quiet. So we need to step up the discourse around amending the constitution in ways that remove those articles or those provisions that we find inconsistent with the ideals, our democratic ideals, as we have experienced them over the past 30 or so uh, years. So that's a view that I hold, that the constitution needs to be amended. And let me explain that amending the constitution should not be misconstrued to mean that we are abolishing the fourth Republican uh, dispensation. The two are different. I'm not a legal brain, but I'm aware that even the almighty American constitution contains several amendments which did not attempt to overthrow the constitution, but just to change some of the provisions. And I stand to be corrected once again, but the last time I heard or read something about it, there were about 27 such amendments. So that's how a democracy keeps that system, that project going. But the way and manner in which we are behaving in Ghana, I see that the, the constitution is so sacrosanct that even when we find that some of these provisions are inconsistent with our own ideals, as time moves on, we keep quiet, necessarily because it stands to benefit, benefit. once again the political elite. And, and, and you're spot on on this because, you see, uh, you, you talk about the, the provisions uh, that, in your view, may have li outlived its, its purposes. To think that the vice president is, is chair of the police council and COP Alex Mensah retired makes the point that the, the, this police council chaired by the vice president makes recommendations 
as to who should be promoted beyond a certain rank in the Ghana Police Service to the president, with respect to even this case of the IGP as well. I mean, does this still make sense? I mean, in this, this structure, or it has outlived its purposes from, from, from where you sit? Well, that is a constitution that we have. I think Article or Chapter 210 or 215, whatever it is, that the Constitution creates a police council that is responsible for the political oversight of the Ghana Police Service. And that council is chaired by the vice president. There's nothing we can do about it until and unless we change the constitution. But the dilemma that we have in that provision was well articulated by a good friend, ACP Benjamin Agojo, that you have this vice president who is a political animal who then sits on a council consisting of political appointees and then supervises the work of an IGP appointed by the president who is also a political animal who promotes who appoints or which promotes appoints and terminates the appointments if you like of uh, police officers it's a bit incoherent it's inconsistent so as some people have been calling for, let's look for the other model where the police service, as an example of security sector institutions, you know, are protected from political influence. Otherwise, the IGPs always look over their shoulders. And you and I know that for some strange reason, until probably with this IGP, it is retiring or retired, not retired, retiring police officers at the time of exiting who are given an extension to then serve as a police officer. So this, they, they hold that office, beholding to the one who sympathized with them and appointed them into that seat it will affect their moral courage to take certain decisions, mindful that if they took decisions that are unpalatable to the political authorities, they may be changed. And this investigation that is underway is an example that behind the scenes, there are all manner of arrangements, you know, subterfuges, to try and keep the IGP in check or keep him in line mm. to the extent that even the electoral process that all of us say that will be the only way that we use to elect our political representatives. Even that, you know, according to the conspiracy, you know, is being held ransom. Right. Professor, that's kind of first of all, I appreciate your time on this and then that fundamental concern that you raise about this whole process of uh, police promotions beyond a certain rank with the vice president chairing this council, making recommendations to the president. Certainly, uh, that's a concern. Yeah, I appreciate your time on Ghana tonight. Kind of first of all, you retire as a analyst. Now, uh, something that we're going to sink our teeth into tomorrow. Government has issued a statement detailing the financial stability fund that is established or expected to be established by the end of this month to help financial institutions impacted by the domestic exchange program to get some sum of cushioning. But the details of this document, to some analysts, threatens the ownership structure of especially the local banks in this country. It's a big one tomorrow. Stay with us and make a date, as always, at 10 p.m. tomorrow for Ghana Tonight. On behalf of the rest of the team, I want to thank you so much for staying with us. I am Alfred Okansi. Have a good night.
Dubai. Flamingo paint. Superior durability. Superior hiding. Superior coverage. Simply superior. Buried then, huh? Show me that. Pietro and I are going to a beauty editorial.